My name is Mark Nelson. I'm the CTO for the PKI as a service group at HID Global. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Faisal Razak. I'm group manager in the R&D department at Venify. And Mark and I are super excited to be here. We are going to talk about the changes that have happened in the CA browser forum with respect to different types of machine identities. So what is the CA browser forum? It's kind of misnamed. Uh, so originally it did start out in 2005 as CAs, certificate issuers, and browsers being the other part. Um, that was changed a couple of years ago. So there's uh, two groups inside of it, the issuers, and their certificate consumers. Um, there's a slew of, of different uh, issuers in there. Um, not all are active. Uh, some have only issued a couple hundred certs in their lifetime. And then there's ones like Let's Encrypt that have issued billions in their lifetime. Um, there's only around eight or so CAs that, have, that currently have over a million valid certs out into the ecosystem. Um, but they're there. The certificate consumers are your typical Chrome, Mozilla, Apple, uh, Brave, you know, uh, Opera, all the different uh, browsers. And there's also like hardware vendors like Cisco, who's a big certificate consumer and has their own root store. They're there. Um, so those are the voting members uh, for the CAB forum. Um, for the non-voting members, anyone can really join as an interested party. Uh, there's some other software vendors that are joined and you get to attend meetings, you just don't get to vote on everything. What the CA browser forum does is it gets together and it puts together the rules for the publicly trusted certificates. It's separated into three major working groups. The first is the TLS certificates. Uh, second is the code signing certificates. And then the third is SMIME certificates. There's another working group called the network security group that is actually under the server group. Um, but that's the basic uh, structure of it. Not every vendor or not every CA is a member of all three groups. So there's some CA vendors that don't do code signing. There's some that don't do SMIME. So the interplay between those is, is uh, there's some overlap, but then some are only in the TLS server group. What they do is they come up with the baseline requirements for how to issue each type of cert. And there are certain rules to, for TLS. There's DV certs, domain validated. There's organization valid. There's extended validated. Extended validation that has some, you know, used to have a little green bar. That's most on. Um, but there's specific rules for those certificates and how they get there. Um, each CA is audited. You have to be, you have to have a web trust audit to be a certificate issuer. Web trust uh, 2.0 for CAs or an Etsy uh, if you got the European audits. So how those, how the guidelines are created, each of those CAs has a, or each of those groups has their own working groups. They meet monthly to discuss any changes. They meet four times, three or four times a year in person. Will they go over uh, the guidelines and propose changes to those? They'll propose new ballots. Anyone that's a voting member can propose a ballot. So a CA will come up with a ballot. They'll get two endorsers. They'll put it out there. There's a seven day voting period. If it passes, then it goes into a 30 or 60 day IPR review for intellectual property. Once that happens and that IPR review passes, it's considered final and you end up with a new version of the guidelines. Um, the voting is a little, strange. Uh, it's two thirds of the voting issuers count. It has to pass at least two thirds of the one that vote. If only five vote, you know, three vote yes, then it passes. If 20 vote, you know, you need at least 12 or whatever. Um, for the certificate consumers, it's 50% plus one, which most time there's only four or five uh, consumers that vote. Uh, except for in the code signing working group, the only code signing consumer who weighs in on those regulations is Microsoft. It stays fairly busy um, with all the meetings and everything. There's, uh, there's been, I think, what, eight or nine new ballots this year. And if, the, if there's not a vote on a ballot within 90 days, it just dies and can come back at a later date.
having defined what a CA browser forum is, let's take a look at what are the changes that have been done by different working groups. First of all, we are go going to start our conversation with the code signing certificate working group. And the changes that they have made this year have been significant. So essentially from 1st June 2023, the change that they have made is that all the code signing key pairs that are generated, they must be generated in a hardware module that is FIPS 140-2 level 2 compliant. And the other thing is that the certification authorities have to verify this information. So whenever you submit any request for a public code signing certificate, it is absolutely mandatory from 1st June that those keys are stored in NHSM. Well, not only they are generated within NHSM, the idea is that for a long time and for a permanent time, they will be stored within NHSM. So all your signing operations that happen, they must happen within an, within an HSM or any hardware module. The other changes that they have made, which are significant, is that your all your code signatures must be timestamped. The key pair for your code signing certificates must not be reused, and the private key should be used for a short period of time. These recommendations have come out, they are very stringent in nature, and essentially from 1st June 2023, they went into enforcement. The question is, why? Why CA Browser Forum is coming up with these stringent requirements around code signing certificates? Well, there are reasons for it. Let's look at, let's do some market analysis and see why these changes are being made. Last year, IBM published a report in which they mentioned that an average cost for a ransomware attack is around $4.5 million for enterprises. This is excluding the cost of the ransomware itself, but if a ransomware attack happens, well, the average cost is $4.5 million. When we did the detailed analysis around it, we find out that the initial vector that was used by different threat actor was a stolen or compromised credentials. And for each of them, the idea was that whenever a breach happened, it costed enterprises around $4.5 million per occurrence. Let's take a look at as to what is happening overall in the market right now. If you scan the news cycle for the last six to eight months, what you will find is that in last six to eight months, all the major vendors like GitHub, Microsoft, MCSoft, uh, we, we can talk about Samsung uh, the, itself as well. They all have lost their signing keys. Not only did they lost their signing keys, essentially afterwards those signing keys were used to basically sign a malware as well. And this is just something that has happened or transpired in last six to eight months. So not only the data that is coming out from IBM around their research, but also generally if you scan the news cycle, they are in correlation as well. That keys are being stolen and different threat actors, which could be your APT groups, which could be your criminal organizations, or which could be your hacking, uh, different hacktivists as well, they're trying to steal your signing keys. The question we want to ask ourselves is, why these threat actors are after signing keys? There are different types of credentials. Why target only signing keys? Well, the thing is that the risk concentration with the signing keys is way more than any other credentials. <coughs> if I am a threat actor and I am able to steal a signing key, I can literally sign hundreds of applications with one code signing key. And within that application, I can do thousands of code signing operations as well. So for me, as a threat actor, it makes sense that if I'm targeting different type of uh, stolen credentials, for me, the value that any code signing certificate or key provides is way higher. Just like we in the InfoSec community think about ROI, 
about value of anything in a similar way threat actors are operating in a similar way they also look at what can provide more value for their effort so essentially if they are stealing your code signing keys they are able to easily uh, sign your hundreds of applications and then subsequently do thousands of signing operations with it what it is doing for different organizations is that different <coughs> organizations are now trying to stop unauthorized code from reaching their environment these environments could be windows linux or kubernetes but the key point for different organizations is that they want to stop unauthorized code from reaching their environments as Faz fazel said there's been a change in how those private keys are stored. They have to be in 140-2 level three or higher. Um, so there's no longer any browser option where you used to be able to generate a CSR, send it up to the CA, get it back, you know, your code signing cert. Now you actually have to either through some hardware method attest that that, was cr that key was created in a non-exportable format inside of an HSM or the CA actually has to ship you their token with their pre-configured software that can only be used together to get a cert from that, um, from that CA. There is a possibility of using your own set of HSMs even if they don't have built-in attestation capability, but you have to get a qualified auditor to come witness those key generations and attest that they saw it, everything was done properly, and that that goes on. So that's a, a huge sea change where you just can't hand those out to customers. Um, when you're signing the code, because of those restrictions, a lot of companies are moving to signing services, third-party hosted code signings, um, Vetify Code Protect, things like that. You have to be able to basically establish organizational control on every single one of those signing keys, which leads you to, you're not just doing cert lifecycle management on that, you're doing the complete signing key lifecycle management for all those machine identities, all those firmware signings, all those uh, you know, software signings, everything like that. And that has to be taken into account. Also, when you're going to place the order with the CA, you have to tell them how you're going to do it beforehand. So you have to plan this whole strategy out, how you're, how you're going to do code signing. It's not just, you know, I want one and tomorrow I get it and we move on. It's got to be a much more orchestrated. There's a lot of corporate policies that has to be changed. There's a lot of rules around uh, signing services. They have to be multi-factor protected. There's got to be certain logs. So just using a signing service without knowing all the rest of it, you can't really do. Thank you, thank you, Mark. So to summarize, if, if you look at the CA browser forum changes that have happened uh, in last one year, they will have a significant impact on how you manage your infrastructure around code signing. So do look for these changes. So not only the changes have happened in the code signing certificate working group, there have been some significant work done in the server certificate working group as well. And the biggest change that has happened in last one year is, and this is a significant change, that officially there is a recognition for the first time at the CA browser forum that there is a short-lived TLS identity and there is a long-lived TLS identity. In the past, this, uh, this separation was not very apparent, but we will look at the lat uh, reasons later on, but generally what we have found out is that now at the CA Browser Forum, they are clearly distinguishing that there are two types of TLS identities. One is a short-lived TLS identity, and one is a long-lived TLS identity. So what is a short-lived TLS identity? Anything that is valid for 10 days or less is a short-lived TLS identity. And this, this recommendation will go into enforcement by 2024. And by 2026, the idea is that the identity, the time period for this short-lived TLS identity will be seven days or less. Another thing that marks these short-lived identities are there will be no revocation around it. 
So whenever there will be TLS identities issued that are seven days or less from 2026, you do not have to attach any type of revocation information with it. On the other hand, for your long-lived TLS certificates, you must provide CRL. So this is a clear distinguish operation that they are doing at the CA browser forum. Another change that they have made which will go into enforcement by 2024 is that the CAs doesn't have to provide OCSP responses. So that is another change that they have done around TLS machine identities. Now, let's take a look at why as a whole uh, the organization is making a change, right? Why these changes are happening uh, at the CA browser forum around short-lived machine identities and long-lived machine identities. Well, we all know about the network itself, that the network or the nature of the network is changing. We are seeing a rise of machines and, and generally that rise is more exponential in nature as compared to the rise of people identities. And generally the biggest growth factor that is fueling this growth, this exponential growth, is the containerization of applications on different machines. Gartner predicts that by the end of 2023, 75% of the organizations will have containerized their applications in their production environment, in one shape or another. So 75% is a big number, and we all know that if you are operating in a cloud-native domain, the, the growth of different type of applications and how they communicate with each other is increasing uh, exponential in nature. The similar stats are also available from CNCF 2022 annual survey as well. And generally when they did the survey, they also found that there are 44% of the organizations that are running their prod applications in, in a cloud native platform. Especially they have containerized their application and they are leveraging one or multiple cloud native platform to deliver value to their customer. 35% are already in, in some hybrid model where they have some old applications and then they have some new applications that will be leveraging containers. And then 9% of the folks are basically exploring containerization technology. But if you look at both the trends that are coming out from CNCF and also that are coming out from, uh, for example, Gartner, they are, correlation, they are in correlation. In Venify as well, we are seeing this correlation. Essentially, if you look at the new certificate enrollment that has happened in the last one year, the chart is going, is, is going in a more increasing way where there, is a, there, is, there might be a possibility that eventually in the future it will take more exponential growth. But if you look at the chart right now, if we start this uh, conversation by the start of this year, you will see that the need for the machine identities is increasing over a period of time. Another stat that we have collected from the last quarter is that there were around six plus million issuances last quarter from our customers. And these are only new issuance of TLS identities that were done using our platforms. So what's the organizational impact for this? Along with the definition of the 10-day short-lived certs not requiring revocation, there was a desire to move from the current 398-day long-lived TLS certificate lifetime down to 90 days. Um, once you do that, it's not too hard for one person to upload a cert to a load balancer once a year. It's not a great way to manage it, but people do it. When that moves to 90 days, that becomes significantly harder. You're gonna have six times the number of certs generated per year, even if you don't add any new identities, which we all know we're going to.